Well, good afternoon to all of you. I'm uh, Lee Hamilton. I'm president of the Woodrow Wilson International uh, Center for Scholars. We're delighted to have each of you here. I welcome you to this director's forum with the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Finland, uh, Mr. Ilka Kanerva. Finland has long been a reliable friend of the United States. Throughout the Cold War, it bravely stood face to face with the Soviet Union, which lay just across the border. In 1975, the Helsinki Accords elevated the importance of human rights across the world. As a Cold War historian and former Wilson Center fellow, John Lewis Gatiss said, the Helsinki Accords gradually became a manifesto of the dissident and liberal movement. Today, Finland is making a contribution to the reconstruction of Afghanistan, a country that stability and democratic development is in the interest of the United States and, of course, our partners throughout Europe and the world. We're very fortunate to have the foreign minister with us today to explore the challenges in the Afghanistan and Balkans and elsewhere. He's chairman in the Office of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and as chairman, he's in a very unique position, of course, to comment on these issues. The foreign minister is a member of parliament from the National Coalition Party. He served in the Finnish government from 1989 to 1995, serving in the Ministry of Finance as Minister of Labor and as Minister of Transport and Communication. From 1999 to 2007, he was a member of the Finnish Observers to the Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, serving as chair for four years. From 2003-2007, he also chaired the Finnish delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE. In addition to his service in government, he is a sports enthusiast, an accomplished runner who specialized in the 400-meter dash, Looks like he could still do a pretty good job of it uh, from my standpoint. He's been the vice chair of the Finnish Olympic Committee since 1993. I suppose he was more excited than I was when Finland defeated the United States in the men's ice hockey quarterfinals in 2006 uh, Olympics. <laughs> uh, fortunately, the U.S.-Finland relations are much more amicable off the ice and will stay that way for years to come. His military rank is in the Finnish Defense Forces, and he's a major. He has two daughters, and we're delighted to have him here today. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Minister. Yeah. Thank you. I should uh, start by saying that uh, you totally forgot forget my, 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 my all the achievements on the municipal level. <laughs> 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 but thank you about uh, your very, very kind words. And uh, on the other hand, may I start by saying that, that I was really saddened to hear about the, the passing away of Mr. Tom Lantos, the long-time member of the also representatives and uh, high champion in the human rights and, and democracy as well. So, ladies and uh, gentlemen, first of all, first of all, uh, let me express my warmest thanks to President Lee Hamilton for inviting me to speak to you today and the Woodruff Wilson International Center for hosting this event. This is a great pleasure to share views with you on several pressing issues on international agenda. The United States is uh, in the middle of a hectic campaign period today. The whole world is following the campaign process, and even in Finland, everybody knows the candidates. <laughs> their parties, their rhetorics, their backgrounds, 
and everything. This is an exciting moment also in, 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 in Finland to follow what's going on in, in the States. The choice of the American people is equally important to this nation, but also to Europe and the, the world as a whole, and we follow it with really great interest. The unique character of the priorities and the whole process demonstrates how the tra tradition of democracy works in this country. As uh, the German in office of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, including in this case also the USA and Canada, it will also be a great pleasure to address the Helsinki Commission here in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday. First and foremost, I am proud to lead the organization that helped to bridge East and West divide during the Cold War and promote the historical change of Europe. The OECE, the OECE is uh, animated by a strong commitment to our common values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. It is a forum for open and inclusive dialogue, inclusive dialogue among its 56 participating states. In my view, the importance of dialogue, also a difficult issue, cannot be overemphasized. This is how international relations should work. <clears throat> My turn at the helm of the OECE started off with a, a difficult situation concerning the observation of presidential elections in Russia. I have deplored the fact, I have to deplore the, the fact that uh, in spite of my hard efforts, there was no agreement and no observation will take place in Russia. In, in the presidential elections, unfortunately. Observing elections is one of the cornerstones of the OSCE mandate in strengthening democracy and the freedom of people to choose their leaders. The recent events between Russia and the Office for Democracy and Human Rights of the OSCE, in other words, ODIR, should not lead to, a, to an erosion of these commitments that we all, as participating states, value. I trust that, uh, that this will not be the last of challenges ahead of the German in office in that organization, but I should rather say, as Henrik Kissinger said, said uh, in the New York Times in the year 1969, quote, there cannot be a crisis next week because my schedule is already full. <laughs> this is a case also in, 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 this, in, in these days. The Finnish chairmanship also emphasizes the fundamental role of the OECE in the conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and post-conflict reconstruction. Many tend to forget that the OECE has been a first responder in many crises and development, a range of capabilities, cap capacities in this respect. In 19 field operations play a pivotal role in every warning, early warning and conflict management operations. There are despite in the OEC area to be settled. I'm personally committed to promote a peaceful resolution 
of the so-called protracted conflicts, frozen conflicts, whatever, in Transnistria, in Moldova, South Ossetia, in Georgia, and uh, nagorno karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. You see, Washington is not the only exotic destination for the OEC German in office. There are many. I admit that this is a, a relief to be able to communicate without an entrepreneur. A long speech like this can be a challenge, especially if entrepreneur. And not only for me and the audience, as my entrepreneur fell asleep in Paku in those days, <laughs> it was already 20 years ago, and thanks to the cut of the vodka. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, o the OSCE is and must remain an important political forum dedicated to building pan-European security. Its work on developing democratic institutions and promoting rule of law at all levels of, cover, of governance has increasing, uh, considerably contributed to regional stability and paved the way of many countries towards Euro-Atlantic integration. The European Union, it is deeply committed to our common values of peace freedom, democracy, and prosperity. This is the fundamental purpose of the enlargement of that union. The enlargement process has helped to transform applicant countries into functioning democracies, democracies market economies, and true partners in meeting our common challenges. The EU has strengthened its capacity to carry out its responsibilities also outside, outside its borders on the global level. The, Union, the European Union is a reliable partner for the United States in our common efforts to strengthen peace and stability. In doing so, we need a variety of instruments, political, economic, and crisis management tools. The EU is engaged in the process and uh, is developing its capacities, particularly its ability to respond to crises. The brand new EU treaty will reform the external addition of the Union. The, e e the EU aims at becoming a more efficient and coherent global player, and it is a key player in trade and development, and it has led the fight against, for example, climate change. We monitor elections, we support democratization processes, and we provide crisis assistance globally. In other fields, such as EU commons, common foreign and security policy, for example, our instruments are relatively new, but uh, they involve rapidly. The treaty reforms should bring more coherent on how we operate and a more st strategic approach to the Union's external action. Just before Coming to Washington, I visited Kosovo, where key decisions on the status are now right at hand. We can expect that declaration of independence will be very soon. The Kosovo people have waited years to fulfill their aspirations. We cannot and we will not close our doors in front of them. Both Serbia and Kosovo belong to Europe, and Europe must and will assume its responsibilities in bringing the Kosovar people 
to the road of democracy and prosperity and in offering Serbia the path to integration. It is equally important that Kosovo commits fully to the implementation of the comprehensive status settlement, in particular respect for human rights and rights for communities. The European Union is ready to assume a leading role in constructing the viable Kosovo and strengthening the European perspective. The EU is ready to launch its biggest civilian crisis management mission ever, as well as sustainably, substantially contribute to the economic development there. Finland will actively participate in this, as we do also in K4 NATO's crisis management operation in Kosovo. Both commitments will be needed to a substantial time to come. The international, the international community is engaged in the huge effort of bringing Afghanistan to the modern age. Afghanistan is still fragile and its democratic development has not yet reached all the necessary standards. But nevertheless, it is a democracy which is a historical step forward. The reign of terror that once ravaged Afghanistan and expanded far beyond its borders cannot be allowed to creep back. Afghanistan needs the support of the international community for years. My country is committed to long-term assistance to Afghanistan. We have participated in ISAF since 2002 and are presently deployed to northern Afghanistan together with Sweden. In addition to our military engagement, we are actively developing civilian crisis management activities both within the ISAF, in the provincial uh, uh, reconstructing team and the European Union's Polish mission, EUPOL. To be able to do more, we are intensifying our efforts together with our Nordic partners. We wish to deepen our cooperation in crisis management, in our in engagement in the international organizations and in our national preparedness. In Finland, as in our partner countries, Norway and Sweden, we need to convince our people of the need for the just, uh, subst uh, substantive and long-term commitment to Afghanistan. Then let me, let me say a few words about Nordic cooperation in general. Our Nordic countries have participated in maintaining international security for decades in the UN, in the United Nations framework with NATO and recently with the European Union. Our contribution has been high when counted per, per capita. International crisis management has grown more demanding and we need to be better prepared, properly equipped and well trained. Two recent examples of our joint efforts are our shared responsibilities in the NATO-led ISAF operation and in the EU's Nordic Battle Group. In the defense sector, the rising costs of military procurements and growing qualitative requirements call for intensified cooperation. Finland, Sweden and Norway are currently exploring possibilities for closer practical cooperation, for instance, in the field of training and procurement. In the security policy field, the Nordic 
cooperation benefits both the European Union and NATO. The battle group concept enables the, the EU with, the, with its partners to intervene rapidly in crisis solutions. At the same time, NATO partner countries like Finland will now have the possibility to play the role in the NATO response force NRF. And we, we do hope to decide on our participation in this NRF this coming spring. We share many commitment, com common interests in the northern regions, in particular in the Baltic Sea and Parents Sea regions. regions. The Baltic Sea region requires special attention from all of us. The stability of that area is crucial for Finland's security, but also for our Nordic partners. Here too we need to work together, and moreover the Baltic Sea has become a prominent supply road, and uh, the volume of oil shipments has grown manifold. This is a major e ecological and maritime safety challenge. One could almost describe the Baltic Sea as an internal lake surrounded by the European Union member states. Not a quite. In addition to our long land border, we also share our fishing borders with Russia. Thanks to her energy resources, the Russian economy has been growing fast, and this has given Russia new possibilities. Today, Russia is much more active in foreign policy and seeks to, to, to position itself as a superpower, not only regionally, actually globally. Moscow is pursuing its interests with determination and Russia's military posture have become more active also in our region. The Russian inter internal developments keep, divide, keep giving us mixed signals today. During the past decade, we have seen many positive changes, of course. The country has left the totalitarian past. People can travel freely, express their opinions, but much of the economy and prosperity are also in private hands. But the building a democracy and uh, a civil society has turned out to be much more difficult than many thought during the early, early years of reforms. Maintaining political stability seems to be a main concern now. The change of power in Moscow seems to be almost completed. Despite of growth figure, the challenges the Russian economy faces are huge. Much will depend on whether Russia is able to make use of its new energy resources, modernize the economy and infrastructure, tackle corruption, and stop the negative demographic development. Even if it is difficult at times, I, I, I don't see any other possibility than trying to engage Russia in dialogue and in cooperation. We need to try to engage Russia in addressing global and regional challenges and encourage full implementation of international commitments. Russia's contribution is needed in combating terrorism, arm, arms proliferation, and in many regional conflicts, as well as in fighting climate change. Our bilateral relations with Russia are in good shape. And the problems we face are mostly technical and practical. For Finland, Russia is first of all a neighbor. 
we have seen how the transformation during the last decade has changed Russia profoundly. It has also fundamentally changed the views we can interact and cooperate with Russia. Are we worried of some of the most recent developments in Russia, such as cutting the freedom of press or expression, or the tone when dealing with some of the neighboring countries? Of course we are. But still I do don't see any other possibilities than trying to get Russia on board. While Russia has become more open, its dependency on the outside world has grown. It is a member of the G8 group and the Council of Europe and wants to join to the WTO and the OSCE. It's a member, of course, of the NATO-Russia Council. The EU and Russia have an ongoing dialogue on different issues. We hope this process will bind Russia to international norms and at the same time encourage its political and economic reforms. Hearing the presidential candidates, candidate Medvedev's speech, I was assured of his thoughts and his plans. As uh, long as um, this is the future in Vice Edge for Russia development, I believe the country will be on the right track. Transatlantic cooperation runs through Finnish activities in many fields. It is a priority for our government and it is a central element in the EU-US relations. There is, a there is practically no area I have mentioned today where good and well-coordinated transatlantic efforts would not be needed. The good thing is that uh, the EU, EU uh, e e e European Union, United States cooperation has uh, broadened it to cover all important issues on the global agenda. The dialogue has been enlarged from political and economic issues to new areas such as justice, home affairs, energy, climate issues. We are very pleased with this development. Transatlantic dialogue should not focus on uh, what we think about each other or how many family arguments we occasionally have. We have to be more efficient and more innovative. We need to work together to find solutions. The basic line is we face all these complex challenges together. This is most essential. And they can be eff eff effectively solved only if we work together also in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. He's uh, graciously agreed to uh, respond to some questions, so we'll begin with questions. You have one in the back, Marty. Is there a microphone available? I don't know if there is or not uh, on this side. Marty, just speak up, if you would, please. I'll just speak. Okay. Oh, there it is. Well, th thank you for that uh, moral speech, uh, Mr. Uh, Foreign Minister. Uh, my name is Marty Sletzinger. I'm from the East European Studies here at the Wilson Center and a graduate of the Helsinki process from uh, Belgrade, Madrid, and Stockholm early on. Um, I'd like to ask you, though, about Kosovo, which you uh, referred to, and the role of Finland. Uh, it seems that the hand of Finland, in a way, is all over the Kosovo problem. Uh, everywhere you look, there's an important Finn involved. Uh, there's former President Ahtisari, w labored long and hard on the uh, compromise agreement, which uh, may or may not become the basis for an agreement in Kosovo, but certainly and hopefully parts will. Then at the EU, uh, Mr. Oli Wren 
has been in charge of the EU enlargement and has been negotiating at headache pace with uh, the Serbs on many very difficult issues. And uh, I wonder, you know, if this policy uh, really, and then of course there's yourself and Finland now find themselves by chance as chairman in office just when Kosovo is reaching ahead. Uh, so my question is, um, well, it's not really a question. I'm sure this wasn't a matter of policy. It just worked out that way, at least I would hope for your sake. It is. But, the, uh, but my, my main question is, how do you, sir, with your experience and your country's experience that's worked closely together with the old Yugoslavia and then with Serbia, how do you see this Kosovo issue working out over the next few weeks and months? And how do you see Kosovo and the OSCE, especially if your large neighbor uh, to the east that you were talking about decides to veto uh, their um, entrance into the OSCE, not to mention other functions? Thank you very much, sir. Yes, Mr. President, thank you very, very much about your very knowledgeable question. Thank you, indeed. Uh, so. In a way, the moment has come, and it means that uh, that uh, in the nearest future, there's a there's an obvious CDI, so uh, unilaterally declared independence declaration by Kosovo, but more or less coordinated by Washington, with Washington and uh, with Brussels, the US and, and the EU. Uh, why not also the NATO? Because uh, K4 operation in the, in the region, K4 NATO-led operation is also in the essential role. So what is the right guess of the, of the date? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to to give any any guess, but uh, but anyway, most probably in the nearest future. And this is predictable uh, procedure. But uh, but uh, beyond that, it is uh, more complicated to 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 give any any very sure and clear answers. The most important element from our side is that, that uh, in my view, that the international community must attend the situation. The, the presence of the international uh, actors and organizations is very, very needed. Because uh, there's a risk about uh, uncertainties and, and, and unbalanced uh, uh, situations in, in Kosovo region, especially in the northern part of Kosovo, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the area where the minorities of the Serbs are in the reeling, uh, leading role. And uh, as we know, there are plenty of the uh, armed, uh, organized groups uh, not with a high profile, but anyway, they exist in there, maintaining their the activities. And uh, you don't need any big major provocation if, if, the, if the, some uh, phenomena uh, are, are starting to escalate. And that kind of, of situa in that kind of situation, the international community must take responsibility to calm the, the conditions in the area and to, to give the protection to the minorities, ethnic, ethnic minorities in the region. And it can be done mainly by, by, by NATO-led K4 operation. It has its own, own, own responsibility, and it's very central one. Uh, then there is a mission by, by the uh, United Nations, and this is also 
in in very important role. They have very very broad uh, mandate to do in in the civil society whatever they want to do, and and they they want to take responsibility. And then there is also the OECE mission in the region. And as you mentioned, the Russia has announced that they will use a veto to stop to finish that mission, mission of, of approximately 1,000 people working for the civil society in Kosovo, trying to promote the circumstances and conditions in, in there. It is, it is extremely important. And I'm trying to, 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 to make circumstances to safeguard that, 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 uh, that mission can continue in there. And uh, I'm not hopeless. I'm optimistic that we can, even if they will use a veto by, by Russia, uh, I think that we can, uh, we can reconsolidate the situation, restart the discussions about the new mandate. And if this alternative is, is not possible, I think that uh, the, o, uh, the, the EU will be, uh, will be there. And, and we have been in touch with the EU so that that EU will take take anyway responsibility of the of the region and, and various activities in there. A question here. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Minister, my name is John Sandrock. I now work for Analytic Services Incorporated. But in 1995-1996, I was privileged to be the deputy head of mission and then for six months the acting head of mission at the, US, at the OSCE mission in Tajikistan. I then joined the secretariat for five years and was, in fact, the first one to go into Kosovo from the OSCE prior to the conflict and so on. Um, but my, my question really has to do with your efforts in Moldova and some of the so-called uh, frozen conflicts. The Minsk Group has been working for many years. Um, the situation in Moldova, your colleague Kimo Kilhunen worked very hard on trying to resolve that issue. What is your outlook for resolving any of those issues in a meaningful fashion, in a final fashion? The Minsk Group has been going on for well, 12, 13 years now, mm -hmm. and although Andrzej Kostrzyk has done an outstanding job, and he will continue to do that, I'm just curious what your plans are to try and move those along to some kind of resolution, particularly also in Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. It's an almost intractable conflict. Yeah. <clears throat> in Azerbaijan and, and Armenia, that's very much also an American question. But, uh, but one con what concerns uh, Moldova and Transnistria, I went to the region, I went to Moldova, to the, to the capital of Moldova, to meet uh, the president, prime minister, foreign minister, and, and, the, uh, and the speaker of the parliament. And, uh, and it was, uh, let's say, exciting experiments, experiment. Because uh, uh, Moldova is a, is a society, Moldova is a country where the previous uh, regime is, is uh, anyway today also existing, very much indeed. Um, but anyway, they are, they are doing their best in Moldova also to find a solution to the Transnistria frozen or, or protracted conflict. And uh, I also went to, to uh, Tiraspol and uh, Transnistria and um, and I, I can recommend to go there. It is it is a real real uh, interesting experience for everybody. Uh, when I met the president, the president of of, of, of Transnistria, uh, in his office, he has a huge painting of, of, of Lenin and it tells it tells very much indeed about the society and the regime in Transnistria. Uh, nevertheless it is uh, more than sure that that this conflict is also very much uh, to, to do with with uh, with uh, 
Ukraine and, and, uh, and also Moscow. And the main thing is that, uh, that we, we, can, we can start or restart the discussions, negotiations with them. Now they haven't been in touch. Moldova and Transnistria, they don't recognize each other at all, you know. And, uh, and uh, my first effort was to try to get them at the same table. And they promised to do it. They promised to do it. And now I have asked very, very experienced ambassador of Finland, Finnish ambassador, very experienced Heikki Talvitie, to go there to start discussions, uh, what to do uh, on, on the practical level. And they have promised to support his activities, trying to arrange these kind of negotiations to start. And it will happen. I, I'm optimistic. Uh, so going there, talking with them very open-minded way, and, and trying to, to tell that what could be the, the positive positive alternative for them uh, you, you can manage you, you can't you can't you can't obli oblige them to do something but but saying that you will find some positive alternatives in front of you before you it's it's possible and now i'll i'll continue my efforts going to to Ossetia and 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 uh, going to to Karab Nagano Karabakh and so you have to make acquaintance with those circumstances, and this is this is uh, my effort. And uh, in all of those visits, they will followed by by that special envoy, Mr. Heikki Talvitie, who is very experienced in those regions. He knows everything, and everybody knows him. And and I trust very much on on, on his activities. Another question uh, clear in the back. <clears throat> Mr. Foreign Minister, um, my name is Cassandra. I'm a student at um, George Mason University, and um, I have a question about. Is the microphone um, on? Is it? Uh, okay. Hello? Can you? Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is on um, the Russian claims to the Arctic Ocean and um, if it's creating any tension with the, the Nordic states. Uh, Russia is doing what? Um, Russian <laughs> claims to the Arctic, Arctic Ocean. Russia uh, claiming the Arctic Ocean as its, as its territory. Yeah, okay. there's, a, there's a discussion, discussion going on on that subject. Yes, that's true. And, and for example, our, our, our Nordic friend, mainly Norway. They have uh, some open, open questions with Russia in that area. And, and uh, I know that they are, they are in, in close cooperation, close uh, discussions, uh, ongoing processes is, are, are going on on that subject. Uh, but uh, I think that that this is not the only question they have just on, on the agenda together. They have also some common interests uh, to put forward. How to utilize those resources in the area? What to do with that? And, and what kind of infrastructure is needed? Even if uh, some, some disagreements are existing between them concerning the, the geographical uh, borders in, in the region. I'm not too well informed about those discussions, but I know that, that they, are, they are trying to talk with each other, Norway and Russia today, in that special area, because uh, there, there will be, most probably, there will be huge resources for oil and gas, and, and what to do with those, because Russia, for example, they don't have that kind of technological equipment to utilize those areas, and it will be it it will be the huge huge challenge in in uh, in in economic terms or as well. Uh, they said that uh, in the first beginning there ought to be at least 
40,000 people, workers, to, to start with those projects in there. So it means that it will be very, very big area, and, and, and how to utilize those resources is a uh, very interesting question. And, and uh, Finland is following those discussions uh, mainly together with, with Norway, but, but not only the Norway, of course, we are also touching those problems with, with, or challenges with, with, with Russia. And we know that, uh, that Gazprom is one of the key players in the region. And uh, some uh, major players in, in Europe are very interested also to invest their money in, in these projects. For example, France is one of those countries, nations, to, to put their money on, 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 on that area, to be involved in, in various activities in, 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 in some years to go. Okay, well, we've only got time, I think, for one more question. We'll go to this gentleman and uh, conclude because the foreign minister has to be on his way. Sure. My name is Ron McNamara with the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe. Thank you very much. Um, my question pertains to the CFE Treaty, another one of the challenges on your plate as chair in office, and I wonder if you could address the current dynamic and what prospects you see for this treaty, which has served a very valuable purpose in terms of governing conventional armed forces deployed in, in Europe and, and, and Moscow's unilateral decision not to adhere to the Mm -hmm. commitments under the treaty. Mm -hmm. I think the problem, problems began after the Istanbul Agreement, more or less, at that time. And, uh, and Russia has announced already for one year's time that they will, they will use a memorandum or, uh, um, or they will refuse to, to implement the agreement so that it was not a surprise for everybody. And uh, they have argued that, that if all of those NATO countries are ready to, to sign agreement of Istanbul, they are ready to do it also. Uh, they don't want to argue about those, uh, those specific problems which are on their responsibility, in their responsibility. We know those, those uh, specific problems also. But what to do? I hope that that uh, that um, United States will continue, uh, and and uh, it will be it will be ready to to wait to find the proper conditions to get Russia against into the implementation of the agreement, and I am very convinced that that uh, that the USA knows. And, and they, they are following this basic line, doing their best. And uh, Russia has uh, said that, that uh, it's not totally excluded that they will implement also in the future that treatment. And I think that, that it has its own logistic ideas, but it's also part of the bigger challenge and, and bigger baggage, uh, so to say, uh, so that so that uh, if there will be some some new elements in the discussion in a positive way, I think that that also this treaty of conventional arms in Europe uh, is is possible to to find the positive and constructive solution, and 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 Russia will be also in the future part of that agreement. I'm I'm not totally pessimistic. I'm optimistic. Let's express our appreciation to Foreign Minister Kenerva. And, uh...